Hello. Today I have this sea turtle painting that I am in the middle of. I started this sketch a couple of weeks ago and kind of set it aside for a while and was working on the botanical pieces for a bit and miscellaneous other stuff and finally getting back around to it right now. Not entirely sure yet what I'm going to do with the upper part of this painting. I think it's kind of why it got sidelined for a bit. It's kind of a pair piece to go with that mermaid one that I was working on last month. And I had the same problem with that piece. I also kind of did the bottom half of it and then didn't really know where I was going to go with the upper portion and just let it sit while I mold that over. And I never really came to a conscious decision about it, but finally decided, okay, I got to get moving on this painting again and finish it. <laughs> so whether or not I know what's going on up there, I'm just going to take my brush and paints and get started and see where it takes me. So here I am again with this piece. I guess it's part of this series. <laughs> the shrug my shoulders and who knows where it goes aspect. Hi, Mega Meganium. I am so honored <laughs> to be your favorite artist. What are you working on inking right now? And red integral, do I use regular watercolor? By regular, do you just mean paint paints? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, if you mean, you know, specific brands or something. I, I mostly use Daniel Smith, but here and there I kind of wander off to a few other brands for random elements. Sometimes there's a particular color from one brand that I like. For example, I'm really attached to this blue currently, which is a Roman Sesmol. It's cobalt teal. He's a Polish company. And so these are a few of the colors that I have from there. And I also really enjoy Artistic Isles sparkly pigments. These are a lot of fun. I've been using those a lot recently, you may have seen. Though my, my core set of colors tends to be Daniel Smith for now. A lot of these other bands, I, I can't get them in tubes for one. And I like tubes because I can carry around large quantities of paint well, large quantity of colors, I guess. <laughs> Not quantities of paint, very small quantities of actual paint, but large quantities of color in my little mini palette disc. And I can only do that when I have tube colors. So that's, that's one of the things that's keeping me uh, with Daniel Smith as my basic color set still. But I also really like their, their pigments. So, yeah. <laughs> what kind of brush am I using? This is a handmade brush from Tracy uh, Lebenzon. And you can find links, links to his 
uh, Instagram page in some of my other posts and in my other past live sessions. I have it linked there. But he hand makes these brushes. And I'll link it in this one too when I archive this video later. So if you want, you can check back there and you'll see. But this is his Stiff White Synthetic Brush. I also really enjoy using his Goat Hair and Synthetic Blends. I used this one on my last demo last week when I did a full sunflower painting during my live session. And you can watch that happen if you go look in my archives again. So one of the only things I was certain about with this painting when I was sketching it in terms of the color, anyway, one of the only things I knew I wanted was orange sails on this boat. The rest of it just has kind of fallen in place as I've gone. No real planning on the color scheme, although I, I sort of knew that I wanted these teal candy tones to it, because as I said, this is sort of a matching piece as a pair with the, the mermaid one that I did last month. And that one also has these colors in it, the, these uh, purpley blues and greens. And so I want this piece to, to match that in the feel of it. It doesn't have to be the exact same colors, but I, I do try to have the general thematic approach but I did want to have this bright orange sail on this boat as something that would stand out from the rest of the cool colors in the painting. I'm just glazing color in over a base tone of orangey yellow that I laid in earlier. Let me zoom in here for you because I know this is small detail work and sometimes it's hard to see what my brush is doing. Oops. Amanda, thank you. I'm glad you like the books. Yeah, I've been showing little bits and pieces of this one in my stories. It's It's been in the works for maybe like two weeks now. <laughs> I do want to paint more sea turtles though. They're, they're always so much fun to do. I go back and forth between dry brush and glazing and then these light washes of sometimes pale color and sometimes just a slightly damp brush which will blend in the textury bits 
that I did with the dry brushing. And I go back and forth like that across multiple layers to, to build up intensity and, and build up the complexity of layers. Do I have a certain paper I use? Yes, I do. My preferred paper these days is currently Moulin de Roy, which is from Canson. Unfortunately, Canson is discontinuing Moulin de Roy. So you can still find it online at some places, but it is getting harder to locate. So if you wanted to try it out, uh, you should try doing that sometime soon and ordering <laughs> because it is unfortunately no longer going to be available once they are all out of the current batch. And there are some replacement papers, but I haven't yet tried them, so I don't know how they behave. This is the 300 pound hot press. I, I always like hot press. Occasionally I paint on cold press. Things like when I'm when I'm messing around with gouache with much more loose and um, stuff that I'm, I'm painting when I'm out and about on site, out on hikes and things, or when I'm traveling and I have my, my little travel sketchbook. I like the cold press better for things like that, for loose things where I, where I can just get really quick, easy texture from skimming my brush, dry brush across the surface of the page. But when I'm doing my more in-depth detail pieces like this one here that you see, more planned, I, I like to have a smooth surface because of the, the techniques that I use, I like really layering in my colors and building up my textures more intentionally. And a lot of that, that quick texture that happens when I dry brush across cold press doesn't last across the, the many layers that I tend to do. So I, I prefer instead to have a smooth surface like this. <laughs> Jay Bischoff. This is, I mentioned it earlier, this is uh, Tracy Les uh, Levinson's handmade watercolor brushes. Stiff white synthetic. I'll list, I'll list it in my, in the notes when I archive this video. So you'll be able to see that later. Where? But this is the stiff synthetic bristle, which I really enjoy. It has a nice super fine point. And I've been using it a lot now for about two months and it, it seems to be holding up quite well in that time. Oh yeah, back about the Moulin de Roy no longer being available. This is, this is basically the story of my watercolor painting career is constantly finding a paper that I really like and then it stops being produced over and over. I think this is the third paper that this has happened with. I used to really like a Strathmore paper at the beginning and then that stopped being made and then a Fabriano and things got changed with that and and then this is Mulan now, and I was just notified by someone in my Patreon Discord chat informed me that it was no longer going to be available, and I was really sad. <laughs> but you get used to it. And then it's a hunt for some new favorite paper. I've I have a I have a small stockpile of it though myself, so I'm I'm good for a while. But I think one of the ones that I wanted to try 
next up was uh, Saunders Waterford because I my painting style is very similar to a lot of other botanical artists and a lot of them who really like Moulin de Roy also like Saunders Waterford so that sounded promising to me. Jay Bischoff says, I always wondered how you styled your work. It's all so good. Your technique is awesome. Not sure what you mean by styled my work. Uh, do you mean how I acquired a style or how I came about that? And yeah, I, I get people thinking when they, even when they see me working, they think that I'm using a colored pencil or a pen or something because of the way I do this really fine dry brush and gradual building up of color. I get asked by people in, in private messages frequently afterwards, what was that pen that you were using? And I have to tell them, nope, <laughs> there's no pen. No pen was involved. It was all paint and brush. Meganium, how do you find your style? So this is what I tell people frequently because that's a question that comes up time and again is, is how do you find a style? How do you figure that out? And my answer to it is always you don't you don't go actively seeking a style. You don't you don't go and say I need a style to make myself to make my art, you know, noticeable and memorable, you, you, you just do, you do your thing. You do what you love. You do the art that is, is crying out, you know, to be made that you love and the way you see the world and you just do that. And over time, your voice becomes visible in painting form or drawing form or whatever it is that you're doing. It, it, it just comes out. It happens because you are doing this thing that you love and that has meaning to you and is a way of your seeing the world. And it, it happens because that is just what's in you. And it's not going to be something that you can pinpoint and make occur. I mean, you can, but it's it's not going to be authentic that way. And it's not going to be something that you're going to be happy with creating and sticking to if it's if it's not something that is really internalized in you. So yeah, just do your art, just do what comes naturally to you and what your eyes want to see on that page and eventually people will look at your art and say, I know that artist, I can recognize that style. It's just how it happens. Now I started watercolor back in, let's see. <laughs> I started it in 2000, so I've been doing it, I've been, I've been mucking around with watercolors for about 20 years now. I mean, you know, as a little kid I played with watercolors also, but I'm not counting that stuff. And, and prior to 2000, I had been doing some painting, I've been doing acrylic. And I also dabbled a little bit with some classes when I was in high school with oils. And I played around with digital art back in 1998, actually even before then. <laughs> I remember getting on my dad's computer when I was a kid and starting to copy the art of Wendy Peeney from Elf Quest. Yeah, that's what it's called, Elf Quest. <laughs> I had these 
I had these comics that my cousin, my, my cousins were much older than me, and so they, they had all these comic books and things that they no longer wanted, and, and so they passed them on to my brother and I when we were kids. And I came across ElfQuest when digging through the piles of comics that they had given us. And I was so excited about these books. And I read them and I was copying the art to practice. And I used to I would get on my dad's computer and he just had Windows Paint. Well, I mean, that's all there was. <laughs> there wasn't anything else. And so with Windows Paint, I, I was using my mouse and basically just doing one pixel at a time to create uh, art with it. And to do any kind of shading, you, you just have to space your pixel colors out you know, your 16 colors. <laughs> and then when I got to college, my friend in computer science, you know, he saw some of this pixel art that I had created when I was in high school. And he's like, hey, I have this program that I think you should try out and you, you might really like it. And he showed me Photoshop. It says Photoshop 1.0 and I was using my mouse still at that time to paint with but I was so excited to be doing artwork with this amazing program which was a giant step up from <laughs> Windows Paint. McGanny, I was saying I use Windows 98 Paint too. <laughs> Yay, someone else. <laughs> I know, this is making me feel old too. <laughs> but I'm glad some of you out there know what I'm talking about. Yay. Do any of you know Wendy Peeney and Elfquest? I mean, not know her personally, but know the material that I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, Gockwell Studio asks if I've tried Arches 300. 300 pound, I'm assuming that's a typo there, 300 pound watercolor. Yeah, I do have some Arches paper, hot, uh, cold pressed, I think I have. Oh wait, no, I have some hot pressed too. I haven't used it in a while. Uh, I like, I, I've tried it side by side with the Moulin de Roy and I just like how the colors, uh, how, how much more brilliant the colors feel on the Moulin de Roy. So I, it's my preference. I know a lot of people who really like arches, but for me, I was getting a little frustrated. It might be my techniques and, and how I work with it. And, and it probably is because there seems to be a paper for every artist that I know and they, we all use different things and have different preferences depending on how we work with it and what our styles require from the paper. But for me, the I, I get the best results using using this one. Yeah, there were also a lot of X-Men comics in that stash that my cousin gave us. My brother grabbed most of those, but I liked reading them also. So while, while I was busy drawing elves and things, he, he got started drawing comics. 
and he is currently doing comics now too as an adult. It's funny how those things really influenced us a whole lot as kids and, and kind of stuck with us into our adult careers. Tara is asking what brand of brush I'm using. And this is uh, Tracy Lebenzon's brushes. I'll link it in the notes on this video later because I get I'm keep I keep getting a lot of questions about that. So I will definitely have it as a link later and you can see that. Although I'll type it out now too, I think. don't have to erase pencil lines very often because most of the time it just kind of rubs off on its own over the course of me working on a piece and just the, the layers that I do. But every once in a while when there's a very pale background I need to do a little bit of erasing. But for the most part, I keep my pencil lines pretty light so that they sort of get rid of themselves all on their own. Both fan studio says, I love that Dark Sword Sword Miniatures has a line of miniatures based on your art. Yeah, that's those are fun. I, I like I like working with Jim over at Dark Sword. We shared a, a booth space for at least ten years at Dragon Con when I was going there along with uh, Larry Elmore and, and usually one or two other artists which kind of rotated over the years but but Jim and I were kind of the ones that stuck around for a long time and he did miniatures for a lot of D&D &D old school stuff and he was doing the miniatures based on Larry Elmore's things and Jeff Easley and uh, Keith Parkinson and we had some uh, mutual admiration for what each other was doing. I, I really like those miniatures. And, and I also used to paint a lot of them when I was a little kid. I loved, one of my favorite things to do was go to the game store and buy miniatures and, and paint them. And I didn't even play, I didn't even play D&D at that point because I didn't know anyone who played 
and I couldn't figure it out with, with just me and my little brother. <laughs> and so all I could do was buy these miniatures and, and, um, and we just loved painting them. And, and so, you know, when Jim asked me one day, he's like, hey, I kind of want to do a line of stuff for your art. Are you down for that? And I said, yes, that sounds like a lot of fun. Joanna is asking, what pencil do I use? And have I ever experienced rubbing out, causing subsequent painting to bleed a little on that patch of paper? Maybe it's more likely on cold press paper. I use an HB or 2H lead. HB is the softest I will go for the sketch on my painting. I'll use softer leads when I'm sketching and thumbnailing and, and doing things like that. But as far as the actual painting goes, I, I tend to stick to the harder leads. So I'll use HB and 2H. And I use a mechanical pencil. My favorite mechanical pencil for my pre-painting sketch is, let me see if I can find where I stuck it. Oh, there it is. My favorite pencil is this Oren's Pentel Point Two. <laughs> it is a very teeny tiny lead. And the thing I like about this Orens is that it has this uh, sheath to protect the lead from breaking. Because I have tried, so there I popped it out just now. I have tried Point Two lead in the past before I had this pencil and just got super frustrated with the fact that the lead broke super easy. But because this Orens has that um, sheath that kind of advances the lead as well as you, as you draw with it, so you don't have to keep um, clicking it out because it, it, it automatically senses when the lead is short and hitting the edge of that sheath and then it, it will advance the lead out farther, which is a super cool thing that it does. I don't know how it works. <laughs> but because it's so, so thin and small, it leaves very little lead residue on the page and because I'm using a hard lead begin with. Between those two things I have uh, very little that I need to erase. Now when I do need to erase, okay, so I, I my way of transferring my painting to my, my watercolor paper means that I have minimal erasing that happens because I go through so many steps along the way of refining my sketch and getting it prepared for this final stage on the surface of my painting paper that I there's not a whole lot of erasing that's going to need to happen here. So that's the first part. Um, secondly, so when I do need to erase, I, I like to use a kneaded eraser for a lot of things. And I can just sort of do this, you know, you kind of press it on your paper and it will pick up the lead and then I don't need to rub. But you're right, I think that cold press is going to suffer from um, the paper experiencing damage and therefore not being able to maintain its integrity and have that same 
feel for the paint as it does before you do any sort of action like that. And even with hot press papers, I, I noticed that some papers behave differently. Some papers will have these, you know, micro tears much more easily than other papers will. And, and as a result, yeah, I, I do notice occasionally on some papers that the paint will behave differently on a patch where I have done erasing versus a patch where I have not. But I do try to erase as little as possible on my painting surface paper. I try to get all of that kind of stuff out of the way, all the figuring out my composition and the exact details of a piece in the early stages of planning and sketching so that minimal erasing has to happen. Because even with the best of papers, yes, I have noticed some little bit of that. Yeah, Faber, uh, I'm not saying Faber Castell low dust eraser is great for that also. That is also my second favorite eraser. It's uh, just this, this green one I have. Um, oh, here's, here's an unopened one. Yeah, they, they come in green or white. I don't think there's really much of a difference. <laughs> but they call it dust-free. It's not completely dust-free. It, it kind of clumps a little bit more and is there doesn't seem to be as much of it. But I like those. This is the part where I'm not sure what I'm doing next here now. I knew I was doing the boat. I think I want to add some more shadowy fish around here. Not necessarily full detail fish. I'm doing, doing one more with like this amount of detail and then, then I think I'm going to be adding some more that are a bit shadowier. Joanna is asking if I can talk about my preferred way of transferring my sketch to watercolor paper. I have a few videos in my YouTube about show, showing you that whole process. So if you want to go look for that later, you can, you can look that up. But in a nutshell, hold on a second. Let me finish blending out this little bit here. And then I will grab some of my intermediate sketches from my drawer to show you. Let's 
So I start with thumbnail ideas and sketches. And they look like this. Yep, so those are those are thumbnails. These are our little thumbnail sketches. And so where's one? Let's see. So you can see that one right there. That is a little thumbnail for this is a much more refined bit for focusing on the figure in that little thumbnail drawing. So I'll do the thumbnails like this and I scan that and I'll sketch the main focus elements of the piece. In this case it's the woman and the cranes. And I scan this and then I, I take those into Photoshop and I place all the elements, you know, both the, the thumbnail and the, and the refined part of it into the thumbnail. And it, it doesn't have to look good because this is just a completely intermediate um, process step that I use Photoshop for. So it doesn't have to look like anything good at all. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I, I share a lot of these in some of the walkthroughs that I do in my Patreon. So if you're interested in, in more detail about that, you should check that out as well. But once I get the digital layout of everything in place, then I either uh, print out, well, there's multiple, there are multiple ways of doing it. I can either print out on one or several pieces of paper that finalized layout at its final size. Or I sometimes just use my computer screen and I have a tablet screen so I can I can move it and tilt it and and use it as a drawing surface if I need to. So sometimes I'll use it as a light table and I'll just tilt it down and put tracing paper on top of that that final layout sketch and so either either on my screen or over the printouts that I make or sometimes I use my etcher mirror which is another transfer device but one of these methods I use to basically get what's on my screen onto a piece of tracing paper and then once I have it on a piece of tracing paper for example, here's one I have of a butterfly. Yeah, here's the painting of the butterfly, the final piece. The sketch, I don't know if you could tell here, you can see the berries on the left side, berries are on the right side here. So it's flipped because what I do is I take this traced sketch, I put it face down on my watercolor paper, and I rub I rub across the back surface of my pencil drawing. And what that does is it works as sort of a rudimentary transfer paper, carbon paper type of thing, because the sketch then, the, the graphite gets transferred from the sketch paper, the tracing paper, onto the surface that I'm rubbing it onto. And then from there, now I can go and refine and do any final little revisions and tweaks to the details of the piece. The, the composition at this point is fixed for the most part because I've wrangled with it and I've worked it out digitally and in thumbnail phase so that I I know where I'm going with the layout and where everything is positioned and the sizes of things and the anatomy of my figures. I don't want to be having to fiddle with that stuff once it's on my watercolor paper because if I do then 
that's going to mean a lot of erasing. And then, as, as we mentioned, that will hurt the integrity of the, the watercolor paper surface. So I get it all done in advance. But like I said, I have numerous videos of this in my archive. I think even I may have done some of it in one of my recent live sessions here on Instagram. So you can, you can check my archive there as well and see if you can find it. I don't remember exactly which one it is, but I, I believe I, I did one of my recent pieces like that. And I, and I have some, a more full explanation in a more edited video as well on my YouTube. But one of the things I like about that process, so I know it, it sounds, it always sounds really lengthy when I tell people about it because it's, I'm basically drawing the same thing three or four times and it, it sounds like a lot of work and it is, but it also is a refining process because with each iteration that I do like that, I am getting the piece closer to a form where I'm not going to be unhappy with any element of it because I've taken care to consider all the problematic aspects and at that, that point it is in as good a place as I feel comfortable with it being. And all the flipping back and forth because I, I do end up flipping it and mirroring it and then mirroring it again. By doing that it lets me really get a good perspective of what might be problem areas, uh, particularly in composition, because often composition things, you don't notice the flaws in it and maybe how something is off kilter in the way it's weighted and the way things flow and, and move across your page. You don't really notice that once you've been looking at a painting for long enough or looking at a sketch or drawing and it, it all becomes normalized because you have looked at it for so long <laughs> that you don't see the flaws anymore and so by flip-flopping the piece back and forth multiple times like that it gives me a fresh perspective each time and I'm more able to see the flaws and remedy them before they become a problematic element that I'm going to have to furiously try to figure out once I've started painting. Now I have had a few, I have had instances where I've gotten pretty late into a painting and suddenly it'll jump out at me that the arm of the woman is wonky. <laughs> and at that point, I, it can be very frustrating because I have to figure out a way to fix it because I don't want to live with that. I don't want to just leave it there because I know it's going to really, really irritate me and I don't want to have spent 50 hours on a painting where I am I, I know where I know that the anatomy is off on the main focus of the piece. So I want to minimize the chances of a situation like that. And so by going back and forth so much in the advance, in the, sorry, in the early stages of a piece where there's, there's little at stake yet and where erasing is easy, then I can avoid putting myself in that situation. Given that, I mean, I've always found a solution <laughs> when I have found myself in those situations. I've found ways to lift the paint uh, or to, you know, somehow make it so that I can redo an area. Uh, there have been times where I've just said, screw it, and I've taken a big clump of of watercolor ground and just painted whole, over a whole area and decided to redo it. There have been times when I've done that. 
there's one painting that I absolutely hated. It was mini. It was just a little small piece on a wood panel, like a, this five by five inch wood panel. And I painted it and finished it and it was just stuck in my drawer. Oh, maybe it wasn't finished. It was like 75% the way done and I hated it. I thought it looked awful. I didn't like the wood texture going through the face of the figure. I didn't like how her face looked. And so I just took watercolor ground and I painted over 70% of the, the painting. And it worked for that because I had to paint watercolor ground onto the wood in the first place in order to paint watercolor on it. So doing something like that on paper though would mean a noticeable shift in the texture of the painting surface. And so I don't, I generally don't like to use watercolor ground as an error correction, cover up this horrible mistake I've made type solution. I, I prefer, if it's on watercolor paper, I prefer solutions that involve like lifting and or darkening areas or blending versus something like the watercolor ground, which I don't feel is optimal for solution, for a, a, an optimal solution for error correction on paper. But as I said, in that particular situation, because I was painting on wood and the wood had already been prepped in advance with watercolor ground, because that was the only way I could paint on the wood, um, it didn't shift the texture base very much. And in fact, I, I ended up really liking the piece that resulted once I repainted it because I, I covered up about 75% of the original piece that I had and started over a new painting and it had some magpies in it I believe and I left enough I left the tiny little pieces of textury bits that I liked from the original painting and those bits just added this really nice rich under texture and tone for everything and so it turned out to be a piece that I really liked in the end but it sat in my drawer in its first initial incarnation for I would say like a year and a half where every once in a while I would lift up the stuff that was on top of it stacked on top and go oh I hate that painting put it back <laughs> and shove it back in the drawer <laughs> See what pencils transfer the drawings the best when you rub them is asked by Tara. I so for my final drawing, as I mentioned, I like to use I like to use um the the harder leads. But for my early phases and my my thumbnailing and my early sketching and figuring stuff out. I actually prefer much softer leads and I will go for the most part with 2B, uh, yeah, usually usually a 2B lead and I'll use like a thick lead holder or a 0.5 mechanical pencil. So for those early rough stages, I actually do use both a softer lead and a larger lead than I do for the final phases because it's easier to get capture the concept and you know, the flow the the shading those kinds of elements in the early phases with softer thicker leads than it is with a thin refined one where I'm trying to just get down to the final details and little fiddly bits What watercolors am I using? It's being asked by Creative Soul. I am currently using Daniel Smith watercolors. And with with uh, a couple of blues, Roman says mall. So I'm using ocean blue and cobalt teal also for a lot of this gorgeous 
blue stuff. But for most of my palette here, these are mostly Daniel Smith's. Joanna says, what is watercolor ground? Watercolor ground is, you know, let me show you. This is a container of watercolor ground. This is the titanium white, but it also comes in clear as well as black and beige. Ugh. Okay, it's sealed pretty tight. <laughs> let me see if I can find another one to open right now. All right, here we go. This one is a transparent one. And it, it's called transparent, but it's more like a milky translucent. So you have to paint it in thin layer if you want it to be clear. And I like using this for painting on wood so that I can maintain the wood texture. But this is what it looks like. The transparent is a bit more flowy. The, the white... Um, this one is a bit more chunky and chalky. Now, it is used to prep any surface you want for painting with watercolors. It's, it's basically like a gesso, if you're familiar with um, oils or acrylics. And it is a... it's kind of an intermediate surface. That you can use. I've used it, I painted it on wood, I painted it on metal. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna show you the little metal done with it. I've used some watercolor ground on the surface of this tin, and then I can paint watercolor onto that, and then I sealed the whole thing with resin, that's why it's all shiny right now. But yeah, it's it's fun stuff. <laughs> I use it for a lot of things. Uh, again, if you want to see a lot of the applications that I've used it for, I, I have a, a lot of walkthroughs and things on my Patreon where I talk about my use of watercolor ground because it is one of my much used mediums alongside the watercolor. Uh, creative soul what watercolor set are you using are you comfortable sharing it I I'm not using a particular set I craft my own sets so I I tend to buy I like to buy tubes the most because I like to be able to create my own palette sets from the colors so this is a mini palette which I designed and um, etcher etcher lab carries these now but I, I like to set up my own array of colors in the palette. But I'm, I'm mostly using Daniel Smith. And yeah, I'm happy to share any of my tools and materials information. So yeah, you're welcome to always ask about that. And I'll, I'll link everything that you see me using in this video, I will Put it in the information when I archive this later so you can always check back and see there if there was anything that you had a question about. Amanda is asking me if I've ever tried other mediums besides watercolors. I have tried many mediums. I've painted in oils, in acrylics, I've painted digitally, I use pen and ink, I have done intaglio etching, although not for a really long time, because that's one of those things, even more than, than oil painting, where you really need to have studio space dedicated for it. <laughs> Yeah, having a vat of hydrochloric acid in my home is not something I want to do. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've messed around with a lot of different things. These days, primarily, I work with watercolors. And let's see. And, and although I, I wouldn't say that I work in any traditional way with watercolors. I, I have sort of my own mixed media approach to it. 
uh, I guess mixed media these days usually refers to digital, so I'm not, I'm not doing digital with it, but I'm mixing in a lot of opaque techniques and I use uh, gold leaf frequently. Sometimes I use resin as part of the final painting and in the construction of a whole piece into a more three-dimensional object type of thing. And yeah, so I I mix a lot of things in, but I but watercolor is my my primary color element, and has been for about twenty years now. Do I have any tips for using watercolor ground on metal? Not really. I mean, it's pretty simple. You just you just slather it on and let it dry. And it says on these that you should let it dry for 24 to 48 hours. I have never <laughs> let it dry for that long. I basically paint it on and then as soon as it's dry to the touch, I, I start painting on it, which happens, you know, it depends on how thick of a layer you do. I mean, if you do a super thick layer, it can conceivably take many hours to dry. I have very, very rarely slathered it on that thickly that I needed more than three hours, but more often at the, at, with the thin layers that I do, it takes 20 minutes and then, then it's ready for me to paint on. So yeah, no real tips. It's, it's, Fairly, yeah, it's fairly straightforward. So just, just paint it on your surface and then it's good to go. I guess the only tip I have would be if you want to use the transparent one. Uh, like I said, it's not transparent, really. It, it's more of a milky translucence. So you, you have to be careful not to lay it on too thick if you want whatever is underneath to be showing and to be featured, for example, wood. If I want my wood grain to show, I need to be very careful with how thickly I layer the ground on so that it doesn't obscure the beautiful lines and textures of the wood. All right, I think we are coming to the end of an hour. In fact, I think we're a little bit over. So I know I missed a few of these questions, but if there was something that I missed, hold on to it. And I'm doing these mostly on a weekly schedule these days, uh, Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific time. So mark your calendar for next week if you want to join me again. And if I missed your question, feel free to bring it up again next time. Thank you everyone for joining me.